Good morning, I'm Beth with SIPS Certified and thank you so much for joining us today for the Strategizing Social Media in 2020 webinar. So I manage the SIPS Certified program. I've been doing that since 2009 and we help vineyards and wineries share their dedication to sustainability by taking care of the people and the planet. We have an amazing agenda today. We're gonna to be talking about best practices on social media, hashtag campaigns, and give you tips on how to use video, both live and pre-recorded. A big introduction to our fabulous panelists that I'm really excited to have here. These ladies are just a wealth of knowledge. We have Danielle Cox, who's the social media manager at JLore. Danielle is a marketing professional with experience in both technology and wine industries. After 10 years of contributing to the advancement of Silicon Valley technology firm, she was inspired to follow her passion for the wine industry and joined Jay Lohr in 2017 to manage their community and philanthropic partnerships. Today, she is their public relations and social media manager. We also have Megan, who's a social media consultant. Megan is a trained microbiologist and began the transition out of lab work into social media with the arrival of her first child in 2011. Today, she specializes in Facebook, Pinterest, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Her current accounts include the popular general interest craft blog, Skip to My Lou, as well as Twist Bioscience, a publicly traded biotechnology company. And Tamara Bingham, marketing manager at Jackson Valley Wines. Tamara is an experienced professional with almost 10 years of wine industry proficiency in sales, marketing, brand management, public relations, and event planning. She has held many roles in the industry from wine club administration to direct sales manager. Today, she is the marketing manager with Jackson Family Wines. We have a great handout for you. It's a social media checklist, so I recommend that you download that. We'll also send it at the end of the event in an email. It's a great way to just take a check at what you're doing on social media right now and plan for the rest of the year. Okay, well, I'm going to hand it off to Tamara and we're gonna start by talking about some general best practices that you can employ when you're managing your own social media. Great, thanks Beth. Hey everyone. So um, predominantly today, I'll be talking about two of our Jackson Family Wine brands, Cambria and Nielsen. So if you wanna hit the next slide, Beth, I'll show some examples of um, our feeds on both Instagram for Cambria and Instagram for Nielsen. One of the big best practices I wanted to touch on today is really understanding the tone and the voice of your brand. Ideally, there's something cohesive going on. Hopefully you all can tell that a lot of thought goes into um, what we call our brand standards, fonts, colors, types of imagery that go into everything that we think about posting and kind of ties back into Beth's third poll question into insights. You also need to tailor your content for your audience. And to do that, you have to understand who your audience is. So if you go into your Instagram or Facebook page insights, you can see um, how you skew male to female age-wise. Instagram tends to skew a little younger as a platform, and that holds true for both of these brands as well. Um, uh, we tend to skew a little bit more dominantly female, so we have a little bit of that imagery that caters to that audience. But um, yeah, and then the voice of your brand. So, you know, talk about your customer. Who is your customer? Uh, Cambria, it's obviously a little more female driven. Um, we like to talk about Cambria customers being similar to maybe an anthropology customer. Nielsen is a little more beachy, a little more masculine. We have a lot of surf, outdoors imagery, that kind of thing. So yeah, just understanding who you're talking to and how you're talking to them are some big overarching best practices. Danielle, Megan, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, thanks, Tamara. Uh, those are some really great examples. <clears throat> um, for us, what informs our voice at JLore um, are our three pillars of our brand story, uh, which are family, place, and craft. So uh, we create content for all of our different social media platforms, predominantly on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, recently LinkedIn, um, to reflect at least one of those pillars. Um, and that's what allows our brand voice to stay authentic. 
um, to add to the best practices already shared. Another thing to keep in mind um, is to make time to create a content calendar. Um, you know, you can decide what works best for you and your brand, uh, but at JLore, we strive to plan our content at least two weeks in advance. Um, and we also have or overarching thematics um, that we plan out months in advance. And, um, you know, one thing to keep in mind too, with creating a content calendar and, you know, out in advance, you also want to monitor um, the current climate on social media to make sure that what you already had planned um, is still relevant when it comes time to posting. Megan, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Yeah, actually, uh, that's very true. Uh, with everybody at home and COVID and all the, the topics coming up these days on social media, it's really important to monitor and be aware so you don't have a misstep. Uh, so two of my clients recently, we, we had to uh, make some changes last minute due to the climate that we were seeing online. And we just canceled some days entirely and then got back on the next day or the next day. So I do think that's a really important point that you made. And going back to what Tamara said, uh, each of my clients currently have also developed their own sort of look. Uh, Skip to my Lou has her same fonts and her, uh, if you check through, look through her Pinterest account or her Facebook page, you can tell it's like, okay, that's one of Cindy's recipes or that's one of her posts. And same with Twist. Twist uh, definitely has gone with a good color theme. And so you can see, okay, that's Twist. I can just recognize it as I'm scrolling through quickly. I don't even have to know it's them. I just see it. And so if people are scrolling quickly through their feeds on their phones, which most of our customers are and clients, and you can see really quickly, okay, that's going to be something I want to click on later on. We have a question from the audience on best practices. It's how frequently should you be posting? Do you guys have guidelines for that? That's a great question and it changes all the time. Um, and it changes, we could go down a we real wormhole to do with algorithms guys, but um, right. you, you should definitely be posting a couple times a week. Um, you need to determine, you can also look in your insights and see what days perform well for you, what times perform well for you. And then um, on Instagram specifically with stories, the way that that algorithm works, you're going to be rewarded the more often that you post because it's going to stay in your customer's top highlighted section along the top um, rather than if there's a lull, then you'll get bumped and they'll see the other things they follow first. So those are really overarching, but do you guys want to add anything to that? Yeah, I, those are great points. <clears throat> Another thing with looking at your insights too is to monitor engagement on certain days that you post. Um, so then you can plan out to, you know, let's say you get the most engagement on Wednesdays, you know, at, you know, four o'clock or three o'clock, then, you know, you can kind of tailor and try and gauge like maybe I should be posting on Wednesdays and see if that's a trend. Um, but yeah, posting at least a two to three times a week for us um, just to stay top of mind um, and uh, keep on top of the news feeds. Yeah. Another, um, two more questions that maybe each of we could have uh, one response each because I know we do have a short little event today. The first one is does it actually help to boost your post? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's an easy one. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, again, I could go down a crazy wormhole here, but um, you know, there are some stats that show if you just do organic reach. Uh, you're only actually reaching a quarter of the eyeballs of the people that are even following you without putting any money behind those posts. So, I had recently um, yeah. researched eight to nine percent is all you're getting. Oh god, yeah, yeah. Wow. so it's bad, yeah. A follow-up to that too is uh, should you post on your page and follow up with a story as well or just do one or the other? You know, it's always great to more content out there, the better, um, especially like if you're talking about on Instagram and you have a static post and let's say you're not getting great engagement just from organic engagement from the, the original post, you can share that to your stories and, you know, add those uh, little gifts or graphics to tap for more information to hopefully reach more people in different streams than you would have on your regular static post. Always both, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And one final one before we move on to our hashtag campaigns. How often should you be posting if you haven't launched your brand or sales yet? So I guess this is looking to build brand awareness. 
I'd, I'd say the same guidelines apply. Um, you want, if someone is just exposed to your brand, whether it be wine or something else, and they're picking it up on a shelf or seeing it in a restaurant, um, a lot of data suggests the first thing that people are going to do is check the social media feed of that. You don't want it to seem empty. You don't want it to seem like um, you're ignoring it. You want it to seem like there's a brand presence, even if it's a new brand. So I would say just as often as an established brand. Right. But and then with that, too, to add, um, keep in mind, uh, you want to, you know, post with intent to um, look at what it is you're trying, what story you're trying to tell, uh, what call to action you're trying, you know, if that's to raise awareness or to, um, you know, get people to recognize your brand in the stores, you know, some really great high quality uh, bottle shot images, um, just some great tips to keep in mind. I think also be consistent, too. That's important. If you're going to post every Monday, post every Monday. If you're going to post every day, post every day and get a rhythm so people know what to expect is coming. Great advice. Ready for hashtag campaigns? Ready. Yeah. All right. Here we go. So starting off with Danielle at JLore talking about some of your hashtag campaigns. Great, thanks Beth. Yeah, moving into the hashtag campaigns, I just wanted to really quick share a few best practices to keep in mind when creating a new hashtag. You know, um, try and keep it simple and relevant. Um, you know, you wanna also search that tag before using it with your brand to make sure that it's not affiliated with anything else. Um, and then try to be as specific and unique as possible. And before I get into my examples, did anybody have anything to add about best practices um, for creating those hashtags? No, I think definitely search to see if it exists already. <laughs> Great. So for JLOR um, on the screen here, uh, you'll see our hashtag JLOR Women Initiative, uh, which began about five years ago when we recognized the value of having social media in our broader marketing plan. And as with most hashtag campaigns, hashtag JLOR women um, was a great opportunity for creating brand awareness, as well as spotlighting our brand support of diversity and female leadership across departments. Um, so fittingly, uh, the campaign occurs during the month of March, uh, when we're able to tap into other trending topics, such as hashtag National Women's History Month and International Women's Day, um, as well as uh, it's the same time uh, of the annual uh, Women of the Vine and Spirits Global Symposium, uh, which is a great synergy with this campaign. Uh, really, hashtag JLOR Women uh, was the start of a true omni-channel presence for us. Um, what you saw at the store level would be what you saw on our dedicated landing page on the screen there and um, our digital and print ads, as well as in social media. Um, and Beth, you can go to the next slide. So then uh, looking at how we could reach a larger audience, uh, we did partner with Wine Enthusiast uh, to promote our campaign um, on their social media channels. Uh, and they have a combined audience of over 800,000 followers. So, um, you know, we wanted to see maximized viewership of this. Um, additionally, the campaign received great press mentions uh, with a feature article on Forbes.com. And this is a site that has over 3 million monthly page visits, thus exposing um, our brand and our message to new audiences. Um, and to wrap it up, you know, uh, we have been able to measure the success of this campaign, um, not only by those joining in the hashtag JLore Women conversation throughout social media and in the press, um, but by seeing 4.5 times increase in page views on our uh, dedicated campaign landing page year over year. So I could share about this initiative for hours, but um, I'll, I'll end here and I'll pass it over to Megan to talk about hashtags. So we're a little different here. Um, I use hashtags with most of my clients. Um, today I'm talking about Twist and Skip and they're, I find them very successful on Twitter. I've noticed a few, I did some investigation. I see a lot of wine brands on Twitter. I, I don't know if that made it into the poll, but uh, so I see very successful on Twitter, Instagram, of course. Um, also Pinterest, if you're there, and then LinkedIn as well. So I don't see so much um, engagement on Facebook with hashtags. So kind of take it or leave it. Um, it doesn't hurt, I think, but it, it maybe it helps a little, maybe not at all. Uh, so for my examples here, this is Twitter and this is Twist feed. And just um, last February, March, I started tw the Twist swag 
uh, hashtag for Twist. Uh, it, their, their swag is super popular and it comes out at conferences or they send it to uh, along with um, packages that customers are ordering, things like that. And, and we get a lot of uh, users or customers t posting their, their pictures of their swag. So it's like, we need a hashtag so we can track some of this. And so people can share it in an easy way for me to see because I do monitor the feeds every day. And if somebody has got something up and has tagged twist, I'll go back and add twist swag. And so since it's new, I'm having to do that with everybody. So you can see where I've done that on each of these. I've gone in and, and mentioned that. So it helps for, for brand awareness that way, tracking campaigns, growing our audience. See, oh, it, it also helps just like make sure that, that other users are seeing this, other, other followers on, on Twitter. And then Twist also does a good job. I'm not responsible for this part, but Twist does a good job of adding the hashtags to their, their little cards that they have out at conferences. So that's some, a good idea. Maybe if you want to do that in your, in your wine shipments or in your tasting room, just have, have a hashtag there on a little card. And then that'll help your customers have a, have a, a good spot to post their own picture with their wine or, or with their in the tasting room or something like that. And that'll help drive people. Um, okay, let's do the next slide. Okay, so this is a little bit different how I use uh, hashtags here. These are sort of like the motto, if you will, of each of the, the customers I'm working with right now. So we make DNA is sort of twists overarching hashtag that we use all the time forever and ever. And I use this to tag any kind of content that points back to the Twist website. I use it for tracking. Uh, so anytime somebody's publishing about Twist, I try and add it there. And so you can use that for your own brands, for tracking for your own purposes, but also anytime somebody might stumble upon it, they can click through and automatically are taken to your, your information. So it helps keep them in your feed, in your uh, look. And for Skip to My Lou, I use this a lot on Pinterest. I don't know, I, I, I didn't see too many people there, but you can also use that there for uh, keeping people in your brand and then also having people discover your brand. So for instance, with this particular one, I also use crochet as a hashtag. So if anybody's looking for crochet, they'll, they'll also find it here. Um, I think that's all I have. And that goes into one question that just popped up about using popular hashtags versus your own personal ones. Mm -hmm. so like using crochet versus skip to my yeah. loo. So I, I usually do both uh, if it's applicable. I use crochet or like say um, chicken dinner or things like that. So sometimes as a user, I go in into Pinterest. I'm like, I have this chicken. I need to use it up. Okay, so I'm gonna like hashtag chicken dinner and then Cindy's recipe will pop up there. C Cindy's the creator of Skip to My Lou, so that's who I'm referencing. Uh, so that's really, really helpful for just people stumbling upon your stuff. And then if your other hashtags there, Skip to My Lou, then they can say, okay, I like this already. And then you, I'll see what else she's got. Yeah, definitely. And people follow hashtags. So um, for the wine industry, if you follow hashtag wine or um, hashtag Cabernet because you're a big Cabernet lover. I think um, Danielle and I were just talking last night about how many hashtags to put on a post. I think yeah. you stopped at seven, right? <laughs> I did, yeah. And uh, per platform too, there's, uh, you know, uh, I think uh, Megan touched on it too, where, you know, maybe on Facebook, uh, it's not relevant for, you know, hashtags perform a different way on that platform. Um, on, I believe, Instagram, it's a maximum of you, 30 hashtags that you can add on your post, but really you have to pick hashtags that are relevant to the topic at hand. Um, so like for the hashtag JLore women, um, we you would use hashtag, you know, women in wine, um, wine professionals, wine industry hashtags to also tap into those trending topics to um, join in those conversations. And uh, somebody who's searching wine industry or a wine professional might find our post and then click on ours and learn more about our campaign and our initiative. Perfect. That actually answers a question that just came in. So Tamara, do you want to jump in and talk about some of your hashtag campaigns? Absolutely. You can go on to the next slide. I'll go fast because I know we're already running long, but um, I wanted to 
talk about very quickly a hashtag campaign pre-COVID and then two hashtag campaigns during COVID because I felt like that was a little relevant right now. So the one on the left, hashtag Women's Day the Cambria Way, um, was a hashtag uh, similar to Danielle's hashtag Jaylor Women. We are women owned, women led, and uh, we have a female winemaker. So this was a nice tie in for us. And then also it has a very clear call to action. So if you um, post a selfie, use the hashtag, we would donate a dollar to two women owned and led charities that sort of aligned with our sustainability and um, female leadership vision. And we ended up being able to uh, um, donate $25,000 each to two charities, Amazon Frontlines and Marin Carbon Project in the Bay Area, which is wonderful. And then, um, so that's pre-COVID. Now during COVID, obviously uh, everybody's at home. We were trying to think of what could we do to um, start a conversation, get a conversation going with people not being able to eat out, go out. So for Cambria, we did hashtag Cambria on the couch and for Nielsen, hashtag adventure at home. Again, listening to the voice of our brands and the thematics that we wanted to touch on. And we use those to ask people, you know, what they were doing at home, what they were drinking, show us their own pictures. And then we also tied those into a little bit of a direct to consumer call to action. So we would put together uh, wine packs on our various um, e-commerce wine stores for those two wineries, Cambria and Nielsen. And we would push those through email campaigns and then also through our hashtag campaigns. So we would say, you know, this pack is available right now hashtag Cambria on the couch, hashtag adventure at home. And then we actually did see for um, Nielsen a 4% growth March through June, year over year for just our direct to consumer channel, which considering that people couldn't go into the tasting room is pretty amazing. And then for um, Cambria actually a 14% growth year over year for those months, um, just by really hammering our messaging and staying um, on those hashtags. So I, I think it can be really successful no matter the size of your winery or your brand. And that's it. All right, let's talk a little bit about video. Okay, great. great. Jay Lore, kicking it off. All right. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, video and going live um, and using video as a way to reach your online audiences, you know, is proving more valuable than ever, especially right now. Um, for us, you know, when deciding when and where to go live, uh, it's really best to understand your core audience in order to uh, create content that will resonate with them. It's kind of the overarching message that we have today. Um, for Jay Lore, uh, an example here is that we've had some really great success with a recent uh, virtual wine club exclusive event. Um, case in point was our celebrating Father's Day virtual event uh, hosted by our founder, Jerry Lore, and his daughter, our CBO, Cynthia Lore. Uh, we promoted this event uh, across our social media platforms um, to encourage our followers to learn more about our wine club offerings. Um, and uh, also created a Facebook event reminder, um, did Instagram stories to do a countdown reminder uh, to let people know when the event would be taking place. Um, it, though it was a wine club exclusive, we did want to open it up for those who would be interested in learning more about potentially joining for these types of exclusive events. Um, so, uh, you know, having an intimate gathering for this event allowed us to create a more personalized experience. Um, which we found, you know, great results, uh, an average watch time of 44 minutes out of the hour long event. Um, so, you know, this tells us that the viewers stayed uh, tuned in for the duration of this event um, without significant drop off. So all in all, a very successful event with high engagement, um, a great way to foster club retention to um, while the wine centers are currently closed. Um, so uh, the success of this event was also a uh, heavily promoted by our D2C team, um, club newsletters, uh, uh, employee newsletters, uh, to just get the word out and to, to spread awareness of these uh, events. Um, we also created um, our virtual events landing page, uh, which is a collection of all of the content uh, that we've been creating uh, over the past three months. 
Um, and we're now able to promote these events across our social media platforms for those who might have been unable to attend the live event. And, you know, even though we had the original event as an exclusive wine club member only, we wanted to also be able to share that with a wider audience um, to see, um, you know, those great live uh, archives of information. And next slide. Um, so moving into uh, pre-recorded videos, you know, as marketers, um, you know, we should always take advantage of every content creation opportunity. Uh, the examples on the screen show um, uh, clips of planned uh, videos that we already um, had in, in our plan to record professional videos. Um, these are of our winemakers discussing our estates tier of wines. And we took advantage of having both of our winemakers out in the vineyard to also record a couple of other short videos um, that we knew we would be glad to have later on. So um, though we had the, the scheduled um, professional shoot, we were able to just pop up with an iPhone and record quick um, on the scene snippets to be able to share at a later time. Um, so this proved to be successful as we were able to repurpose this content to promote uh, national wine holidays, uh, such as hashtag Chardonnay Day. Um, and when it comes to social media, you can never have too much content uh, because we all know it's harder than ever to get new pieces these days. Uh, so Beth, uh, the next slide. This is just an example of one of those uh, pre-recorded videos that we had, uh, a professional polished video featuring our winemaker White Wines, Kristen Barnheisel. Um, we shared this video in its entirety on um, our social channels and it got some great reach of over 28,000 people um, that saw this on our Facebook page. Um, and uh, from this short one and a half minute video, we're also able to repurpose for digital ads and other digital assets. So there's just so many ways to create new content from just one video. Okay, so I was gonna just share some of the basics for videos that I'm finding to be successful right now um, co during this COVID time. I do think it's important to get video in your feeds. Uh, whatever the platform, video is wonderful. Uh, polished, unpolished, live, shared, um, that's also something you do, or even just like a little meme and you have some cute text to go with it. Uh, I also wanted to touch on time of day is very important. I'm finding personally for my both of these clients currently, early, early, early morning is really doing the best. So if you're going to maybe only post one time a day or one time a week, give it a try. It might be different for you, but I'm finding for both of mine like like six in the morning when people are just waking up and scrolling and having their coffee. So this is an example um, of Cindy at Skip to My Lou. She did a live uh, is, that ended up being about 20 minutes, Facebook, about how to make a mask, which was very topical and it did fabulously and it was just I, I think that's her son that's her son sewing with her and her other son I think is just on an iPhone and they had 340,000 that they reached with 892 shares and 250 reactions so this did really well and uh, it, you know it, there's nothing fancy here and anybody can do this just grab an iPhone or find somebody that has an iPhone or an Android and just get going you know just get some video there let's see um the next video so this is also cindy's content and this is a more polished video i wanted to add this as well this it came up during covid at the same time a little later um, and this particular video had 116,000 reach 233 shares 31 reactions so a, li a little less so i think people during this time are looking for something more casual something they can relate to uh, and so don't feel like you have to have anything polished if you don't or if you're small and you don't have money to make something like that, no problem. Just go ahead and get some kind of video in your feeds. Uh, and if you don't have any way to do that, share. You can share from a local restaurant that's maybe put up a recipe. Um, I do that a lot. A lot of my sh my content currently for both clients is sharing anything that's topical and relevant. And people love to be shared. So that's always a good thing too. Wonderful. And Tamara. Yeah, so I think um, one of the things I was going to really touch on is um, very quickly, 
when to go live versus when to go pre-recorded because you're probably all thinking why one why the other so um you'll notice nielsen one of my brands is not even on here um, nielsen has a pretty small following and base on both instagram and uh, facebook we're working on growing those both but in those cases i don't think it's worthwhile to go live you just don't have the audience um to um take advantage of uh, the talent's time or whatever that might be for cambria we were lucky enough to partner with um, a couple influencers and have really successful live video events, one on the Instagram platform, one on Zoom that we uh, promoted through all of our social channels. And the reason that they worked so well is because uh, we were partnering with influencers that had a large following and um, a new audience. So we're not, you know, uh, fatiguing the audience that we already have for our brand so both of those went really well and then um even though we knew that those could go well on mother's day in particular we thought you know there's going to be a lot of live events on mother's day um especially this year when everyone was still home very few restaurants were open so we opted to go pre-recorded on that day and we just had a number of our team members snap um, home videos from their iphones and um, put them all together and we ended up getting uh, 64,000 impressions and 15,000 views. Whereas I think really the noise that day, the number of different live events would have detracted from the impact of trying to go live. Uh, so that's a little bit of best practices on when to go live and when to go pre-recorded. Um, if you wanna to go to the next slide, Beth, I don't know how applicable this is for everyone, but I just wanted to quickly share, we also did a large scale partnership with wine.com and three of our brands, Cambria, Nielsen, and Brewer Clifton. Um, obviously, wine.com has quite a platform, so we were able to um, share across all of our social channels for all three brands, and then wine.com's ch channel, and then we also put money, as we were talking about before, um, boosting posts or promoting posts. We put a little bit of money towards um, promoting those, and our PR department even, uh, partnered with some influencers to promote the wine.com tasting. And you can see a screen cap of the uh, three winemakers and wine.com's host up top. This ended up doing really well. Um, 315,000 impressions, 8,000 engagements, uh, 3,000 clicks to register. And then they post the video once it's done on YouTube and you can watch it forever. And that has a couple hundred replays already. The reason I put this up here, not because everyone has access necessarily to wine.com, but it brings up thinking about who do you have to partner with in your area. Um, although keeping in mind with alcohol beverage, uh, there are a lot of legal restrictions uh, to partnering with licensees. So look that up before you do it. Don't break the law. But uh, there are a lot of options for smaller brands, smaller wineries um, to do something in your area that works for you and, and take advantage of a new audience. And I think- One question on this is, yeah. are the videos for stories or for the feed? And I guess in this case, wine.com was actually on their own website. It's on their own website, but kind of how um, Danielle was talking about and Megan, you can always, if something's recorded, which I'd say nowadays record everything you do, even if it's live, you can repurpose stills, you can repurpose clips, um, you can turn those into digital ads, you can turn them into posts, feed posts or story posts. Um, so just record whatever you do and use it until, you know, there's no life left in it would be my advice. Yeah, it's true. Also, you can, you know, recycle content, repost, even if it's verbatim. Sometimes we do that too, because not everybody sees it the first time around. Right. So you can do it again. Totally. Right. And yeah, from the one video, you can, yeah, everybody touched on, you can take clips from it to make it look new and look fresh and, and you know, tap into new viewers who didn't get to see it the first time. Definitely. That's great. I know we ran a little bit over. I really appreciate everyone who was able to stay a little bit late. Joyce gave us a nice compliment she had to run, but she said that this was really good information in a short period of time. And I want to remind everybody that you can follow us at SIP Certified, and there are our hashtags, hashtag SIP Certified, SIP Your Best Life, and I Spice SIP. 
We also have a really cool handout that's Seasons of Sustainability. So if you're looking for ideas of what to talk about, sometimes coming up with what you want to be showing on social media is challenging. This is a great piece that's broken out by season to give you some ideas of what to go take pictures of. We also just added some really fun jiffies. So if you go onto Instagram and you're doing a story, you would go ahead and click that little head up at the top <laughs> and search for SIP certified. And we have these really cute jiffies that you can add to any of your posts. All right, and you can reach us at sipcertified.org. There were a couple of other questions that came in, but in the interest of time, what I'm gonna do is work with our wonderful panel here and see if we can't get those questions answered and sent out in our follow-up email, which will include links to the social media checklist, ways that you can follow all of our fabulous panelists, a place to sign up for our newsletter because we do send out marketing tips twice a month. So I'd love to have people join that and get some different ideas. So a big thank you again to everyone who joined us today. Tamara, Danielle, and Megan, you guys are incredible and just full of wonderful, helpful ideas. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. Bye.